Tomorrow, BBC Television celebrates a special and historic day, the 60th birthday of Her Majesty the Queen. In the morning, the Queen and her family drive through Windsor to attend a special service of thanksgiving in the beautiful setting of St George's Chapel. In the afternoon, the Queen will be at Buckingham Palace, when over 5,000 children march along the Mall to bring her spring flowers and sing their own special birthday song. And in the evening, happy birthday, dear man. A lively and colourful portrait of the Queen with glimpses of her life from childhood to today, including a delightful exclusive sequence with Prince Andrew welcoming the Queen on board HMS Brazen. A day of affectionate celebration on the Queen's 60th birthday, tomorrow on BBC One. On BBC Two now, there's the second part of the major new series from Germany, Hi Matt. And here on one, our main news is in 40 minutes, after another helping from That's Life. <laughs> with us. Welcome to the viewers, of course. And I suppose that means the official That's Life team marathon time is 12 hours, 17 minutes, which <coughs> may not be exactly the fastest, but you're lovely movers, particularly Molly. You're a beautiful mover. How do you feel? Like an oven-ready turkey. <laughs> beautiful. Really beautiful. And you look it too. As you see, I'm afraid I'm not really dressed for running. My nose runs well, nothing much else does. However, the real reason that I didn't join is that a viewer has sent me the most wonderful T-shirt. She says I must wear it all through the show tonight, so I've been saving myself. She says she thinks it really is me. So I would like to thank her very much indeed. And the uh, least I can do is wear it. <laughs> you think I look better in it than out of it. Yeah. Thank you so much. What do you think, Molly? Oh, oh never mind. You think yourself lucky, Esther, because Mrs. Sales from Biggleswade sent me a pair of tights, which I was thrilled with until I read the packet. To fit hips 48 to 54, <laughs> styled by Dumbo. <laughs> On the other hand, Annie, Marlene, Bart and Patrick watch us in Belgium and their friend Kath Simmons saw what else they watch over there. According to the Belgian paper on BBC One, there's the Wogan Pratt Show. <laughs> How rude. Photograph of the week is by Mrs Hurley from Latchford of her son Michael. She said, 
What did I say to upset him? <laughs> and a viewer in West Germany, driver Simon Scharf, was very impressed by a flower shop there called Blumenek. <laughs> We have a marvellous collection of stories for you this week, thanks to all your letters. And a little later in the programme, we're going to bring you a special children's song written to celebrate the birthday of the week, sung and acted by children. But first, in case you've all gone a bit flabby while we've been off the air, we have some exciting new exercises for you, especially good for any marathon runners who may have developed that distressing condition, jogger's nipple. Because <laughs> these exercises develop the pectorals. These are your pectorals. <laughs> if you call them something different, I don't wish to know that. <laughs> Mr. Brian Sterling has the most magnificent and versatile pectorals himself. He says anyone else can development, develop them if they do his exercises. So we went out to the King's Road in Chelsea with Brian, and he told us what they are. Oh, I've got a good one for the chest. How's this? <laughs> To be actually honest, I couldn't actually tell you how to do it. I just actually pull in and it moves. It's always moved. And what does it do for you? Um, keeps the muscle in tone. Occasionally, when I'm listening to music, I move it to music. I want to sing. Bum, 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 bum. That is amazing. That's how I first started. I was sat listening to some music and I was bored, and that came. Did it? it? Just, just came. And you've done it ever since? <laughs> I've done it ever since. How would you like to be able to do that? Do what? <laughs> what for? <laughs> Your chest fit. How does he do it? How do you do it, Brian? Just by relaxing and contracting. Relaxing and contracting. Do a bit of relaxing and contracting. <laughs> you see it? Nothing <laughs> good. Do you, do, you hear, do you hear my heartbeat? No. It's because I'm relaxed. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Excuse me, sir, do you wiggle? Sometimes I. <laughs> Depends where you want us to wiggle. I see. Have you seen what, uh, what Brian can do? Yeah, no, yeah. I've seen it. I've seen it done plenty of times. Wiggles his pecs. His pecs? He's got some padding in there, isn't he? I Surely. I promise it won't be bad for your image. <laughs> yes, that's, well, that's very good. Um, hmm. Well, oh, God. That would expect a difficult for me, actually. I, I, I'm on a diet. Hello, Are you only good at exercises? <clears throat> Hopeless. What have, what have you ever tried? Um, did a few press-ups once. What happened? I just sort of collapsed. Did you? <laughs> Exercise, which has the advantage that you don't even have to stand up for it. Run, we'll show you. Oh, that's obscene. <laughs> I really am not prepared to wiggle. I'm awfully sorry. Is, it, is this on a, a what? A religious principle? Were you wiggling yourself? Well, no, I was trying. But you were trying, can you? No, I, I'm. Yeah. I, I can't. He, which is a man? There is it. This one. He's absolutely does it a treat. Yes, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. Magnificent. Yeah. Yes. Now, that is your natural bosom. That is my natural bosom. Oh, it's inflatable inside. Do <laughs> you think you might be cheating? I just think I'd, I'd quite like to try it on, but I don't know that one could. It's so cold anywhere. <laughs> have a feel. What? Have May a feel. I have a feel? Which one? Either. Either. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Is that real? Yes, 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 I think it is. How long does it take you to learn? Oh, it's hard to say. I can't, I can't remember. Well, anyway, I wouldn't do it because I've got quite sufficient already. <laughs> I think it's the genuine article. The genuine articles, shall we say. So he is here tonight with us, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Brian Sterling and his dancing pecs. <laughs> There's no question I'm 
going to have to practice that. Do yours dance, Molly? Oh, I'm not going to try. I might go bust. <laughs> Now I bring you this week's bargain offers. Mr. Green from Preston was a little alarmed to read in his paper that you can buy an ultra-violent sun lamp. <laughs> but John Goff from Tamworth was tempted by the offer in his paper from a firm who say, customer stripping service available. <laughs> but you know, some funny things go on in Wolverhampton too. How about this advertisement? Lost. Man's beige trousers in Womborn Churchyard, Monday. <laughs> Makes you wonder, doesn't it? We haven't given this out for some time. Our Jobs Worth Award for officials who insist on enforcing daft rules because they say it's more than their jobs worth not to. But this week, this gold hat goes to the Planning and Transportation Department of the Westminster City Council, who were nominated by Paul Young. He wrote and said, I own a little shoe repair shop. It's in a side road on the edge of Shepherd Market. So when I opened the shop a year ago, I had signs made directing people to it. Three signs, one at each end of our street, and one in Curzon Street. They were very effective. I do a lot of repairs while you wait, and quite a few people used to see the signs and just drop in and have their shoes mended. There's no business like shoe business. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, all right then. You were doing very well then. Well, for about three weeks. Then one evening I shut the shop and went to fetch my signs. And they'd gone. Nicked. Even the one I'd padlocked to a lamppost. A sign fetishist? Well, that's what I thought. I searched the streets. There were signs everywhere for other shops. Restaurants, news agents, film developing. But my signs had disappeared. Any clues? Only one. A customer told me a man had taken the signs, actually cut the chain round the lamppost, and then made a getaway in a yellow van. What kind of yellow van? This kind of yellow van. <laughs> Westminster City Council had nicked your signs. You're right. I rang them and asked for them back. I said those signs had cost me £300 and I needed them. A man said I could have them back but I mustn't put them on the pavement again. Why? People might bump into them. But people might bump into all those other signs for the restaurants and the news agents. Did the council object to them? No. So why do they object to yours? What does it say? It says high class shoe repairs. Keys cut while you wait, and the address and the phone number, and an arrow to show you where we are. Fine. And our name. People often ask what our name is. And you say? Cobblers. <laughs> <laughs> so you mean your sign says? Cobblers. <laughs> and that's why the council didn't like it? Well, in fact, the chap from the council told me my name was offensive. So I tried to do without the signs. But nobody came to the shop if they weren't there. So after four days, I put them out again, and immediately they disappeared again, that very day. No other signs disappeared, only yours. There seemed to be as many as ever. Cafes, bookies, antiques, only mine had gone. Well, it seems three weeks after that, a man from the council brought the sign back with a copy of this, the Highways Act. Paul told us... It said I was guilty of an offence and I could be fined up to £200. We said that must have made you blink. It did. I kept them in the shop. But after about four weeks, business was so bad, I thought I might have to pack up. But that would mean selling everything for half of what I'd paid. Not only that, but there were so many other signs on the pavement, I thought, this is a load of old shoemakers. <laughs> I'll put them out again. He did. He put them back at the end of the road. And this time, they stayed there for four weeks before they disappeared again. Paul told us... This time, the man from the council told me I was on no account to put them back. He said it was an offensive name. And before he retired, he was going to clean up the streets of Piccadilly and the market. But I really need my signs. Is there any way you can help? We did try. We went to Shepherd Market, and it was awash with signs and objects people can bump into. We found a restaurant blackboard, tables and chairs, a wine shop board, stickers and postcard racks, more boards, more tables and chairs, litter bins and a lot of rubbish, weighing machines, and a loo right in the middle of the pavement. <laughs> so it did seem to us that with all that lot, it was a bit unfair to pick on Paul's cobblers, if you know what I mean. So we rang the Westminster City Council and we said so. A gentleman there said... We have a duty to keep the pavements clear. Well, what about all the other signs? Well, I'm sure when you get a parking ticket, you say, what about all the other cars who don't? Sometimes you're lucky and sometimes you're not. So obviously Paul is unlucky. We rang Paul, we said, it's that name of yours that makes you unlucky. Couldn't you change your name? He said... But we are cobblers. Our shop is called cobblers and that's what we are. What do you suggest? Greengrocers? <laughs> we thought about it. And then we saw a bollard right in the middle of the pavement, which was put there by the council themselves. So obviously, they don't mind if people fall over that. So we suggested, that's all right, 
Paul should follow their example. So Westminster City Council, the bad news is, I'm afraid, you just won our Jobsworth hat. The good news is that we've come up with a solution. All Paul has to do is change his sign. To bollards. <laughs> Thank you. Molly. And now here is the news. Anyone who thinks that journalists live in the past should go to Tehran. John Rankin from Argyle went there and bought the Tehran Journal for yesterday, March 20. <laughs> but my favourite story is one that Mr Blackledge noticed in the Mallorcan Daily Bulletin. The Fire Eating Act will be unable to appear tomorrow at Barbossa Nova, opposite Nick's Palace, as he went out with a poor flat. <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh, we had a terrible moment this week. We thought for one ghastly day that our favourite item was going to be wrenched from the programme. It's this, the Shops Act of 1950, which says what you can and cannot sell on a Sunday. For years, it's been a source of innocent amusement and pleasure for us. What other country in the world would have a law that says it's legal to sell a bottle of gin on Sunday, but it's illegal to sell a Bible? It's legal to sell a daffodil, it's illegal to sell a rubber plant. And it's, it's legal to sell fish and chips if you're a Chinese takeaway, but it's illegal to sell fish and chips if you're a fish and chip shop. <laughs> It's legal to sell razor blades to cut your corns, but it's illegal to sell razor blades to shave with. And so on. The reason for that last one is razor blades to cut corns are medical and the other is cosmetic. Doesn't sound logical, does it? But how dreadful it would be if we were logical as they are in Scotland, where shops can open if they want on a Sunday or close if they prefer. Of course, from time to time, spoil sports in England have tried to make the law more sensible. In fact, since 1950, there have been 19 new sensible shops bills They've all failed. On Monday of this week, the latest attempt to iron out the nonsense very nearly succeeded. David Tench, legal advisor to which magazine, told us... The irony is that Scottish Labour MPs voted against it, even though shops can open in Scotland, and 14 Ulster Unionists specially flew over to vote against the new bill, which wouldn't have applied to Ulster anyway. So the bill was defeated by 14 votes. And it means this daft law has actually got to be enforced. Shops will have to be fined if anyone can prove that the razor blades were actually for shaving or the fish and chips were English or Welsh and not Chinese. David Tench told us. It's a complete fiasco. You know, in the eight hours of debate, the poor old consumers were hardly mentioned. But shops are for consumers. It's a consumer issue. And yet the consumer's point of view was ignored. Now, that's disgraceful. The National Consumer Council agrees with that. Wendy Toms from the NCC told us. Last time an attempt to reform the law failed, pressure was put on the local authorities to prosecute shops that opened. And it's not just fines. Some pressure groups insist that councils bring injunctions against shops that regularly open on Sundays. If they break an injunction, shopkeepers will be in contempt of court and could end up in prison. Which is pretty serious. So this morning, Doc Cox went out shopping to see if people realise they're accomplices to a crime because it is still against the law to buy furniture and so on on Sunday. He went to a big do-it-yourself shop, which is open today as it has been every Sunday, and he spoke to the director of the store, Alan Gaynor. I think the MPs have resolved nothing. There's still so many anomalies, it's untrue, that they just opted out of making a decision. There's a shop next door today selling titbits, but they can't sell the Bible. I'm selling plants, but I can't sell a pot to sell them to you in. There's some crazy anomalies like that. Uh, Sunday's traditionally a family day. Do families turn up at all? Sunday's a much better day. The, the staff enjoy a Sunday working because the people who come in are the family. They've had their breakfast, read the papers, the whole family come in. And it, it's a very relaxed day for everybody, actually. It is a family day. I mean, look at the weather. Where are people going to go on a Sunday in England today, except into a leisure store like ours? And how many people come through Do It Alls on a Sunday? We've had about 2,100,000 people through last Sunday around the country. And they come in every Sunday, and different people. And uh, to this store alone, we'll have 8,000 people through today. They can't all be wrong. Do you mind working on a Sunday? No, not at all. You get families in? Oh, lots of families, yes. Lots of children on a Sunday. And what's the pay like? That's all right. It's but £90 a week for a 39-hour week, and it makes a difference of £35 for working today. Oh, terrific. Oh, so you don't mind at all? So you're going to be really all. fed up if the, uh, if the Sunday trading goes I certainly will, teeth. yes. What have you bought? Uh, a trolley and some cement and sand for doing some internal rendering in the house. 
in the house? Yeah. Internal. What's internal rendering? Well, just rendering up, ready for plastering. Oh, I, I thought it was something. I thought it was something medical. <laughs> well, it can be. That's right. Yes, you've got to be very careful. Because you're allowed to do medical stuff. You see, you're allowed to buy medical things on a Sunday. When you said internal rendering, I thought you might be. Uh, it might be some strange. Um, well, it's, it's going to help my medical condition because the place is going to be nicer to live in. That's a good one. You, you realise you're aiding and abetting in a terrible crime? Yes. You're contravening the Sunday Trading Act. Uh-huh. Do you care? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> I work very hard during the week, and this is the only day that I can do something. What do, you think about the, what do you think about the Sunday trading laws? Well, I think it should be, if you like, free for all. In other words, if somebody wants to open on Sunday, it should be free to do so. I certainly appreciate it. What are these? Light bulbs. Now, you're not allowed to buy light bulbs on a Sunday, I'm afraid. It contravenes the Sunday trading act. Oh, what a blow. What I want is some taps. I haven't got the type that I want, so I've got to go to another do-it-yourself store now. Oh, dear. Hope they're still open. Yeah, hope they're still open. Uh, you, so you've got to break the law twice in one day. <laughs> now, what's this that's lurking down? What's that? Oh, that's plastic wood. Plastic wood. Fills, cracks, gaps and nail holes. I suppose that could be medical, couldn't it, if we really tried? Yeah, it could be, yeah. I mean, I might tread on a nail when I'm putting the taps in this afternoon. <laughs> medical? That's first aid. Yeah, it is, Are yes. Are you allowed to buy that? Yes. Good morning. Do you realise you've, aid, you've aided and abetted in a criminal act? Why is that? Because you bought something on a Sunday that you're not supposed to buy. Yes, I must admit, I've broken the cardinal rule buying it on the Sunday. I personally feel that shops uh, should be closed on the Sunday. Sunday is a family day, I think, of uh, family worship where people should be in church rather in, than in shops. <laughs> well... <laughs> We'd like to thank all those criminal accomplices for talking so freely to us. Perhaps the answer is people ought to be free to do both, shop and go to church. But anyway, what advice can we give anyone who wants to go shopping on Sunday, like those people, and any shopkeepers like that one who would like to help them? Well, over the years we have discovered some pretty classy dodges. For example, Michael Robinson from Truro told us... I found out that Jewish people celebrate their Sabbath on Saturday, so they're allowed to open their shops on Sunday. So, by sheer coincidence, one third of my staff have just become Jewish. <laughs> we said, how interesting. Isn't that rather a complicated process? He said, not at all. We have our own do-it-yourself conversion course. <laughs> Unfortunately, that won't really do because we rang the Jewish Board of Deputies and they told us... Sorry, I'm afraid it takes three years to convert and become an Orthodox Jew and the men would need a bit of surgery. <laughs> so you have to be a bit circumspect. <laughs> Another method was invented by Steve McCarthy from Hertfordshire. He told us... I run a do-it-yourself do shop but I studied the law and I saw that under the Shops Act it is legal to sell fresh fruit. So I'd sell my customers an apple or an orange and then throw in a free gift. A roll of wallpaper or a pot of paint. Did it work? Absolutely. The staff were paid treble time and they were very happy and the customers were delighted with their bargains. £99 for a lovely apple and you've got a front door absolutely free. <laughs> £21 a juicy orange and we throw in a drill stand. Wait a minute. Can't you get done for selling fruit if you're a do-it-yourself shop? Not at all. They're do-it-yourself fruit. We very carefully told our customers how to spit the pips out and plant them and grow their own orange and apple trees. Sadly, that didn't work either, because an undercover council official bought an orange and a packet of wallpaper paste one Sunday, then threw off his disguise, identified himself, and told Mr McCarthy he'd broken the law. Mr McCarthy said, No, I haven't. The wallpaper paste was free. You've just bought an orange. The officer said, No, I haven't. I've bought the packet of paste. No, you haven't. Yes, I have. I haven't. Have, 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 Sadly, he was fined. However, the serious side of all this is that many little do-it-yourself shops and garden centres do most of their business on Sundays, and they're afraid they're going to have to close if the law is enforced now. And anyway, after all, what is so wrong with a little shop selling a handyman's apron on a Sunday? David Tench got this. Sold on a Sunday. We asked him where. He said... The little shop in St Albans Cathedral, and it was breaking the law by selling it. He said it's insane. Well, at least it'll keep that's life in business for another ten years. <laughs> and that's why we're so glad the MPs decided to keep the insanity. Incidentally, we have checked 
the Shops Act, now that we're stuck with it in England and Wales, and it is perfectly legal to sell half-cooked tripe on Sundays. <laughs> That's why we do it every week. <laughs> You know, while we've been enjoying our little bre break, you've spotted some more unusual names. Mrs. Fields saw a report about the Secretary of State for Social Services, Normal Fowler. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think I want to visit the health centre that Mr. Davis noticed, the Kill Many Surgery. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want a holiday, do go to a little village in Austria. Mr. Marmont went, and he says it's the perfect place if you're really feeling fed up. <laughs> so there's a tip worth having. Did you see the story this week that 5,000 people died in road accidents last year? Well, 10% of those people were children. That's 500 children who died unnecessarily. As you know, we always try on this program to find ways of saving children's lives. One very simple way is by making sure that every child in every car wears a seatbelt. That way we could prevent two-thirds of those injuries and deaths to children in road accidents. Now the reason for that is very clear if you watch a piece of film which was specially made in America by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. It shows dummy children of about five years old sitting in the back of a van, but the same thing could just as well happen in a car, travelling at about 24 miles an hour. As you see, they're thrown around until they hit something, maybe a, a brake or a gear lever. As one doctor told us, they're like unguided missiles on a course that can lead to serious injury or death. Tragically, David Goldthorpe, who lives in Scunthorpe, knows what happens in an accident like that one because he wrote to us and said, I just had to write to you and add my story to explain why children must be strapped in. Don't let anyone use the excuse that seats are too expensive. If you can afford a car, you can afford proper restraints. I sincerely hope our story will shock other parents into using straps. Our family was involved in an accident. I was driving, wearing my seatbelt, but our three children, Andrea, who was two, Beverly, who was three, and Francis, aged five, were with us. They were in the back, and they weren't wearing belts. In the impact, they were all thrown out of the car. Andrea and Beverly died almost instantly. Francis had such bad head injuries, he died four days later. I walked away from the accident without a scratch because of my seatbelt. The last three and a half years have been hell, as you can understand. Let us change the law. I now have seatbelts fitted in the back of my car. Let's make sure everyone else does. It might be worth changing the law because seatbelts really do work. They do save lives. Lynn Walker lives in Plymouth. After our program, she wrote to us and said, Please continue to ram home the importance of restraints. Christmas was very special to our family this year. We could very easily have not been around were it not for seatbelts. We have two children, Nadine, who's four, and Alex, seven months old. Four days before Christmas, they were with me in the car when another car smashed into me. My car was a complete write-off. I had to be cut out. But thank heavens the children were in seatbelts, Alex in his seat and Nadine in her, in her belt with a booster cushion. All Nadine had was a slight bump on the head where the door hit her. Alex was quite unhurt. The police told us that without their belts, the children would certainly have been catapulted out of the window with terrible consequences. We owe their lives to the fact that they were belted in. This is the range of seat belts and cushions and so on that you can get. These are the backward facing chairs for little babies, chairs with harnesses for toddlers, seat belts with booster cushions for older children, children of over five. And these cushions can cost as little as 10 pounds. And because these are adult seatbelts, they can save adult lives too. If you're worried that this lot may be difficult to fix, Mary Bruce from Choppington in Northumberland wrote to say, After your seatbelt program, I was shocked into a state of guilt. I wouldn't let my children into the car until we'd fitted belts for them. David, my husband, isn't very gifted at do-it-yourself. In fact, he's a bit cack-handed. But even he found it quite easy to fit them. Now, as soon as the children get into the car, they remind us to put our belts on 
And they've started their own mini campaign at their school, persuading parents of friends to buy seat belts. While the campaign is growing, Mothercare have joined in with displays in every one of their 228 stores. And Peter Bottomley, Minister of Roads and Traffic, is de delighted with the progress. He told us... I'm so glad that parents have been out and bought seats, seats and belts. Manufacturers tell me the demand hasn't slowed down. The message is definitely getting through. That's Life has had more impact than all the resources of government could. And I'll continue to back you in any way I can. What Mr Bottomley has already done is to bring out these excellent leaflets called Protect Your Child in the Car. Inside, there are very clear instructions about what you need and how to fit them and what they cost. Usually, they cost less than £40. And they've got pictures of all the different kinds. If you want one of these leaflets, indeed, if you want any kind of advice, there is a free phone number you can ring. It's free phone, which is 0800-234-888. And that number is actually mentioned in the article in Radio Times about seatbelts. Well, our campaign began when Dr. John Maynard wrote to us about a child he knew who died in a car accident and how strongly he felt that children could and must be saved. He told us this week... We have achieved an awful lot, but there's still a long way to go. Only this week I saw a three-year-old child standing loose on the seat of a Volvo. Seat belts are fitted as standard in Volvos. I was so sad to see a child in that danger. So, for the sake of those three lovely children who died without seat belts. It is up to the rest of us to try and protect children from the same danger. And now we have some news for you about another story we've told you in the past, because on Friday this week, Ray Whitney, the junior health minister, made a very important statement in the House of Commons. He said that health warnings are going to appear on these. They're called skull bandits. Perhaps you remember we talked about them in our last program. They're little fruit or mint flavoured bags of tobacco that you're supposed to suck in your mouth. We warned you that they can in fact be extremely dangerous. As Mr Whitney said, Our aim will be to make clear that these products may cause oral cancer and they should not be considered as a safe alternative to cigarette smoking. And he went on to say, The government deplores the introduction of oral tobacco products into Britain, not only because of the link with mouth cancer, but also the threat of dependence on nicotine. Well, the British Medical Association also deplore it. They want these things banned, as they are already banned in Ireland, and so do many of the MPs who spoke in the debate in Parliament. Skull bandits have been brought over here by an American company, US Tobacco International Inc., and because people over here don't know much about them, we suggested that if you see these tins in your local newsagent or tobacconist, you ought to warn the shopkeeper about them. Well, more than 90 people, many of them children, have already written to say that they've done that. One viewer told a shopkeeper in the north about our report on skull bandits and says the shopkeeper told him... They don't sell now, they didn't sell then. The only difference is that they don't sell now even more than they didn't sell then. <laughs> to thank all the shopkeepers who have decided now not to stop them. Annette Webster runs a corner shop in Leeds. She told us... I was horrified to learn that skull bandits may cause cancer. We have no hesitation in taking them off the shelves. But what do you suggest we do with them? Well, it turns out that these can be extremely useful, and perhaps shopkeepers around the country would like to know what to do with them. Over now to our special guest gardening expert, Mr Percy Thrower. <laughs> Well, of course, it is a very busy season in the garden, and it's the season when we should not waste anything. Kitchen waste, any organic matter, such as this, eggshells, tea bags, coffee grains, fruit peelings, can all be made into good garden compost. And what I would do, if I got any of these that I didn't want, and there's no reason why I should want them, is to mix them in with the garden compost. <laughs> you know, I was always taught that prevention is better than cure. The nicotine from those would help to prevent pests in the garden. Put them into a polythene bag. Put it aside, they'll rot down. And make good compost to go back in the garden. Then, of course, it's a busy season in the greenhouse. There's fuchsias to pot on, geraniums to pot on, and, of course, tomatoes. Now, what I would do with those is to use one or two of these small bags in the bottom like this, some compost on the top, 
You see, nicotine has been used as an insecticide in gardens for very many years. And the insecticide there, the nicotine, would prevent any insects affecting the roots of those tomatoes by getting it into the compost. And you know, in the end, we could finish up with a very fine tomato plant, an exceptionally good crop of delicious tomatoes. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Sound constructive advice, what to do with skull bandits. Percy, thank you very much indeed. Molly. You've received some fascinating letters recently. This week's record for the shortest ever solicitor's letter is one by Ian McLachlan, solicitor, who wrote to the chief clerk, Wolverhampton County Court. Dear sir, yes, <laughs> yours faithfully. <laughs> but the rudest solicitor's letter was sent to Mr George Mitchell, who lives in Dublin. It ends, we sincerely regret any offence which was caused by our letter, which was totally intended. <laughs> but Mr Tripp from Wood Green in London was sent the most intriguing offer from Barcelona. Dear sirs, we are writing in order to present us how glass machine builder and a speciality to conformation of glass or crystal for the process so pressing how firm or rounded blow blow. <laughs> I think I've got one of those. <laughs> well now, it may not have escaped your attention that tomorrow is a birthday. In fact, it's going to be a pretty good party tomorrow afternoon. 6,000 children are going to walk down the Mall holding 120,000 daffodils. And when they reach Buckingham Palace, they're going to sing a specially composed new song. It's called the Queen's Birthday Song. And in fact, it's already been recorded by St John's College School Choir with the band of the Grenadier Guards. All the profits from the record go at the Queen's request to children's charities. But we can bring you now the first full television performance of the song because we went out onto the streets and parks and playgrounds of London and there the children sang it. And here they are now with their own tribute. <laughs> Bye. 
lovely song, Natalie and Lisa, our two soloists, well sung. Thank you to all the other children who took part. Just to remind you, this lovely record, the Queen's Birthday Song, sung by the choir with the Guards Band, is being sold in aid of the National Children's Charities Fund for handicapped and needy children, and it is in the shops now, and it would be a very nice way, if you bought that, to say thank you, wouldn't it? So join us next week. Till then, from us all... Good night! Good night! <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.